Anna, go ahead. Thank you, Andrea. And welcome, everyone. My name is Anna Isien, and I'm uh, an associate professor at uh, Stockholm School of Economics, House of Innovation. And um, if you turn on the next slide, please. Um, today's seminar will uh, a brief introduction by me, followed by Anna Bratström's uh, discussion about trust in, in times of uncertainty, a very important topic. Uh, and we will end with a QA. and a And I would just like to say a few words about House of, the House of Innovation. Uh, so if you put, put on the next slide, please. Uh, we're based in Stockholm, obviously, and um, uh, we're uh, the top business school in the Nordics, according to Financial Times rankings. Uh, next slide, please. We're based in Stockholm and uh, we've existed since uh, 1909 with a specific mission to strengthen the competitiveness of Sweden through research and education. And we're a very international school in everything we do, but yet we want to make a contribution to Sweden specifically, its, its society and, and business community. And for this reason, our school has identified four strategic innovation and sustainability. And next slide, please. The House of Innovation is obviously the, the unit responsible for, for innovation. And we're delivering education, we're doing research, obviously, and we have a lot of dissemination activities, this one included, um, partly thanks to our, to our partners. The House of Innovation is generously funded by the Erling Persson Family Foundation, Scania and the Wallenberg Foundations, together with the consortium of partner companies. Next slide, please. Um, and I'm very happy to introduce Anna Bratström to you. Anna is uh, currently at Lund, Lund University at the Stian K. Johnson Center for Entrepreneurship, but she's also affiliated and a docent at, at House of Innovation. Um, trust, and I have really enjoyed reading your work, Anna, and so it's with a great pleasure and gratitude that I, that I give the word to you. So thanks a lot for your attention and enjoy. Take it away, Anna. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for the introduction, Anna. It's uh, when we um, when you have a meeting in Sweden and your name is Anna, you can always count on at least one another Anna in the group. So also this time. So my name is is Anna Dattström, and uh, for those of you who are not in Sweden and who might not be super familiar with Swedish geography, Lund is in the very south part of Sweden. And Lund is a small university city, so the entire city is basically a campus. And usually in May this time of year, the city is vibrant with parties and graduations and the champagne is pouring from the fountains. But obviously not this spring, it's um, much more empty than we are used to. So it's a very, these are very special circumstances for all of us. And as much as I would have loved to give this seminar in place in Stockholm and actually meet some of you, I kind of also appreciate this opportunity to, um, to bridge borders and to participate in, in activities that is actually far from home. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for, for coming. My, um, my main research topic is on innovation and entrepreneurship. So I'm interested in how new things how people work together and how people come together when developing products or services or ventures and businesses that are entirely uh, new to the world or new to them. And my interest has always been in the people side of innovation and entrepreneurship. So less about how to make the perfect business plan and more about how to find the perfect teammate or how to collaborate together, how to build bridges across cultures and how people actually do and how, how they are actually able to coordinate and work together under a great deal of uncertainty. And I think that what we're facing at the moment is more profound uncertainty than, than most of us are used to. We cannot say in the current time 
what will be the outcome of the situation. We cannot say what strategy is the right one or what kind of behavior is the wrong one. We cannot say, and we do not know what the world will look like when we are out of this corona bubble. So uncertainty, which is always profound and important in the context of innovation and, uh, and entrepreneurship, has now become a profound element of everyday activities for most of us. And one aspect of collaboration and people that I've always been very curious about is the notion of trust. How people get to trust each other, how people come to trust each other, how people can trust each other, and also what happens when trust gets broken down and how we can repair trust once it's been broken. So uh, when I was asked to, to give a seminar uh, in relation to this virtual seminar series that the House of Innovation is now organizing, I figure why not take this opportunity to talk about trust because it's such an important aspect of collaboration and coordination um, in times of uncertainty. So we will do two things this morning. Uh, first of all, we will talk a little bit about trust. What, what does it mean to trust someone and what are the different ways and aspects in which we can trust other people? And then we will talk, dig a bit deeper into the notion of uncertainty and try to figure out under a condition of uncertainty when we do not know how can we still trust or when is even sensible not to trust. And the context of this is, is commercial settings. So I will talk less about family settings or society at whole, but more about the role of trust in a, in a commercial, commercial business type of setting. But let's start with the, the notion of trust and try to figure out what, what, is, what is really trust? Is this word that most of us think we have a relationship to, but then once we start to dig into it, it's not always so easy to understand what trust means. And um, two things are important to remember when it, when it comes to trust. The first, is that trust implies to accept vulnerability. If we trust someone, we place our faith in their hands. We make a leap of faith. If there is not an element of vulnerability in a relationship, then trust is not really a relevant aspect of that relationship. So when we trust each other, we make ourselves vulnerable to the actions of each other. And that means that trust goes beyond control. When we can fully control a situation and we, we can fully predict the behavior of someone else, then we do not need, really need trust. But when we are in a situation where we are on the one hand dependent on each other, but at the same time cannot fully monitor and control, then trust is relevant because trust is to accept vulnerability. And I guess the current situation is a, is a horrible example of that where we are all dependent on each other. We are all dependent on each other, taking responsibility and acting in a responsible way in the current circumstances. And there is no way, even though countries around the world are trying with very harsh measures to control, at the end of the day, we all have to accept this vulnerability and we will have to try to trust each other for making good judgment in the current situation. So trust is something that helps us to coordinate and helps us to work together in a situation where we are vulnerable. And the second thing that's important to know with trust is it's that trust is based on an expectation. So we expect that the other party is trustworthy. We form an expectation of the other party in our relationship as worthy of trust. It's not a knowledge, we cannot know we cannot be sure, but we at least try to expect that the other party in our relationship will act in a responsible way. So this is trust. To make a leap of faith, to accept vulnerability based on an expectation of the other party as being worthy of that trust. So you see there is a lot of uncertainty already in the, in the, in the content and the context of trust. So what is trust in our, in our world? And on the one hand, it's important to recognize that we are, as human beings, most of us at least, are very inclined to trust. So trust is typically the default option. When we meet someone new, when we do something, when we have an interaction, most of us tend to assume that trust is present. 
So most relationships starts from a very high level of trust because we are as human beings inclined to trust. And this is something that has served us extremely well during the course of evolution. We are one of the few species who can actually collaborate also with, pe with people that we do not know very well and who can extend our collaborations over very big networks where we cannot always see and control and monitor each other. And our collaborations, especially in the, in the global world that we are living in today, are over, over and beyond small communities like family bonds or societies. We don't even have to share common norms, but still we trust. And the element of trust collaboration is almost impossible unless there is at least some slight element of trust in that collaboration. And what happens when you trust, typically we feel very good when we trust. So when we measure, our blood pressure goes down, we, we tend to feel happy, we feel good about ourselves when trusting. So our, our bodies reward us for trusting. So trusting feels nice to most of us. And we also tend to trust each other based on very, very simple cues. So typically it doesn't take more, much more than the other person in, that we meet. If, if he or she looks a bit like us or acts a little bit like us or behave in a predictable way, then we, we tend to jump on that cue to trust each other. So typically we are very fast to trust in all types of relationships, also in business to business setting. But then at the same time, of course, trust is to make ourselves vulnerable. And sometimes that also makes us become quite vulnerable to the other party. And trust is often misplaced. And when people have done surveys of business to business relationships, so um, um, R and D collaborations or supplier buyer types of uh, collaborations with so these kind of commercial collaborations that happens when organizations try to collaborate and coordinate across the organizational border. Typically the numbers of parties saying that their trust has been violated is quite high. Um, around 50% seems to be one number that keeps coming up in different surveys that the trust that we placed in the other party actually turned out to be misplaced. And especially this happens when there is a power imbalance in the relationship, such as when a startup, for example, collaborates with the big established organizations, then it tends to be even more common that the small firm feels abused or feels that it has been taken advantage by the big firm. So trust, on the one hand, as human beings, we are very inclined to trust. On the other hand, trust is often misplaced. And this is, of course, the, the delicate balance that we all have to deal with when, when basing our relationships on trust. To what extent can we actually trust trust in a relationship? So I have a question to, to you that I would like to just tap into this crowd and, and see what are your thoughts and ideas of trust. So I will now launch a poll, poll here in the, in the Zoom and um, uh, please help me by, by answering the questions that I will provide here. So do you now see the poll on your screens? And I'm curious to understand which of the terms do you associate with trust? And you can click all of them or none of them or some of them if you want to. Fantastic. We see a lot of commitment and a lot of reliability, care and dependence, but benevolence, liking, 
dependence quite low, competence also quite low. It's interesting. But what becomes clear from this list of words is that trust can mean different things to, to many of us. I um, trust my husband profoundly with most aspects. Oh, I see here that the answer is. So here we go. Now you see the results, right? Wonderful. Good. So we see here that reliability and commitment and care tends to be words that many of you associate with trust in business relationships. Whereas benevolence, liking, dependence, and also competence to some extent was, was lower in, in this particular setting. So, so we, we tend to trust means many different things to us and different types of relationships beholds different aspects of trust. The way that I trust my husband or the way that I hope that my children trust me differs from the way that I maybe trust a colleague or the way that I trust um, the person that helps me paint my house, for example, when, when that needs to be happening. So trust means different things. And what is interesting to know is that trust do not only mean different things to different people or different types of relationships, but it also means different things in different cultures. And we're when, if we're working within a global supply chain or in a global world, it's important to know that when, when I, as a Swede, say that I trust, that can mean something very different from what someone from a different culture or a different tradition and background actually mean when they say trust. So let's try to illustrate that. Here we have a, a group of words from the poll. These are words that turned out to be not so prominent. Uh, and your answers, care, benevolence, commitment, liking. And these aspects of trust, these types of trust is something that we typically associate with very deep and profound relationships. This is Chagall in a, one of his many famous paintings of, of love between himself and his wife, how they are flying over a, a rural city with holding each other's arms and, and this, this type of trust that we find in very intimate relationship are typically characterized by care, benevolence, commitment, and liking. And this is what we can, in a simple way, call trust, trust with the heart, a very type of affect-based, based, deep trust. But this type of trust is maybe not relevant or as relevant in a business context, in a commercial context but more relevant in a personal context, or at least it might not be relevant in all business contexts. So let's look at the, the other words, the ones that come out, came out much more profoundly in the poll, like reliability and commitment. And now we will travel a little bit back in time and look at a video recording. And this is from, this is from um, uh, the, the mid eighties, and we will meet uh, Michel Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan in one of their many meetings where they discuss the, the, um, the, uh, um, the, the, the weaponizing of, of, um, from, from the Cold War. So we now have Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev here. And I put on the video. The importance of this treaty transcends numbers. We have listened to the wisdom of, in an old Russian maxim. Though my pronunciation may give you difficulty, the maxim is dobyai no probyai, trust but verify. <laughs> you repeat that at every meeting. <laughs> So they have just signed a peace treaty and Ronald Reagan say that I have learned an old Russian uh, proverb. It's called trust but verify. I will not even try to pronounce this in, in Russian, but trust but verify. And this was, was the peace treaty between the Soviet Union and the US was very much based on this maxim of trust 
that verify. And still today, we have what we call the Open Skies Treaty that allows uh, the US and Europe and Russia to fly over each other's military areas and do inspections of the kind of what kind of weapons that we have on the ground. And it's based on the notion that we trust, but we also verify. So this type of trust is maybe less trust with the heart, less of a trust based on mutual commitment and dependence and benevolence. And I see here in the chat that benevolence is, is a kind of a tricky word and I agree. Yes, Trump has left the Open Skies Agreement. Isn't that a sad development in the world? Benevolence means basically to, um, to make, um, to have an expectation of the other party acting in, in one's own uh, goodwill. So I trust that the other party has my own interest in his or her mind when, when taking action. That means benevolence. That the other party is acting in a way that, that helps to serve me, not only the other party. So this type of trust that used to, at least in the world pre-Trump, characterize collaborations between Russia and the US and Europe uh, is maybe less based on trust with the heart and more based on the words that came out quite strong in our poll, like competence or dependence or reliability. And it's a type of trust that we, we can term trust with the head or a more trust based on reason, right? trust based on cognition trust based on rational thinking. And these are two different aspects of trust. And some relationships hold a little bit of both. Some relationships are more heart-based, some relationships, relationships are more head-based. But um, it, it, not all relationships have all these aspects of trust inherent to them. And that's important to remember when we talk about trust. What do we mean by trust? Because we build trust with the head in a slightly different way than we build trust with the heart. So trust with the head, the left-hand side of this slide here is, it's based more on professional credentials, for example, or past performance. We have certificates that, in, certificates that indicate our trustworthiness. We write contracts to signal our, our intention to be trustworthy or we have an open skies agreement that allows us to inspect each other's grounds to, to be able to trust each other. And this kind of professional past performance type of trace, it, it creates confidence and reliability and competence and dependability. Because we tend to assume that because the other party acted trustworthy yesterday, he or she will act in a trustworthy manner also today. And it's a type of trust that's very common in what we call task-based countries like Sweden or Germany or the US for that type of sense, this more cognitive-based trust. Then on the right-hand side of the picture, picture, we have more trust with the heart. And that's built on a, on a looser ground uh, in one sense. It's based on reputation or personal uh, connections. It can be displayed based on citizenship behavior. So things that are less easy to control or monitor or write down or formulate in written terms and instead aspects of a relationship that, that are more closely related to our feelings and what we, um, what we feel. And this type of trust, trust with the heart, it, it creates a feeling of reciprocal care and concern that, that the, the other person actually cares for me. And this type of trust is, is more common in, in what we call relationship-based countries like China or the Jordan, for example, or Brazil, for that matter. And of course, we find variations also within countries. But to some extent, if we do polls like the ones that we just did here, if we do, do that kind of poll in Jordan, it's likely that the words like care, liking, commitment, and benevolence would actually be higher than, than they were when we did the poll here in, in this type of more Swedish or Northern European, European context. So we have now spent some time trying to figure out what, what, is, what is trust. And we realize that there are different types of trust and, and trust can serve different purposes in different types of relationships. So what happens then when uncertainty is accentuated? What happens in situations where everything that we 
took for granted or assumed to be normal is no longer normal. What happens when the past performance or all of these cues that we have to be able to trust each other may have changed or are different at least than they were in the past? How can we then still build trust or um, do we have to rely less on trust or do we have to change the way we trust or who we trust in our business relationships? And this is what I would like to spend some time on um, right now. So um, before proceeding, I, I would like to do a second poll with you and see here, because I'm kind of curious about this COVID-19 situation and how it has affected or not affected your business relationships, the ones that you have in your context. So I would like to do the same thing as before and, and send you a poll and ask how COVID-19 is affecting trust in your business relationship. And as before, you can click in all of the boxes or some of them or none of them at all. So multiple choices are, are possible. Here comes the poll. Great, then we'll end the poll right there. So now you see the results, right? Trust is more relevant than ever in most, for most of us. And that's, um, that's also how, how I feel to a certain extent. We are, more, we are quite vulnerable in this situation. Our supply chains are vulnerable. Our health is vulnerable to the actions of each other. Um, so to some extent, trust is more relevant than before. I have partners turn, that turn out to be more trustworthy than I expected, 36%. But that's a good surprise. That's nice when we find out that the people that we have been working with or the business partners we have been working with, with turn out to be even more trustworthy than we expected before. But we also have some aspects of trust violations where People have experienced that partners that they thought they could trust actually turned out to be less trustworthy than expected. And I think it's too early to say what will be the cause of this, but at least in the beginning of this crisis, we saw that promises that were made between countries to help each other out turned to be out to be less, the different countries turned out to be less willing to, um, to, um, to, um, to share and to help out each other uh, than what one, one, one might have, have hoped. But I think it's still early to say, and we will have to see whether our global collaborations will become stronger or, or weaker after this crisis. But I had a comment here from Osa in, in the chat saying that trust is always important, but now we need to use other methods to build trust. And I think that's very relevant and, and a nice, nice way of seeing it because some of the methods that we used to build trust before like having meetings or interacting going out for beer especially these kind of events and activities that helps us build the more affect-based deeper level of trust are just not possible at the moment instead of meeting in person we meet in this way on zoom instead and it's it's not as easy to communicate it's not as easy to get our feelings and message through um, in the online world as it is when we actually meet 
basically. It's also more difficult, I think, to build trust with new acquaintances in an online world where we can actually not meet them before. So let's look, let's look a little bit or try to probe a little bit deeper into uh, the, the issue of building trust under more profound uncertainty. And one way of, of looking at this is to um, start with thinking about what do you want out of a relationship? What is this relationship for? Why are you in this relationship? What's your core priority with this relationship you're in? Is it, on the one hand, a reliable performance? I had the example of a house painter before. I'm, I'm hiring someone to paint my house. I'm looking for reliable performance, but maybe I'm not looking for a long-term uh, relationship. Or is it flexibility that you're after? Is it someone who will be there to hold your back? Is it an instance where the relationship maybe matters even more than just the performance of the particular task that you're asking someone to, to work together with you. Because if you're looking for reliable performance, then monitoring is a perfect way of increasing reliability and building this type of more cognitive-based or trust with the head type of trust. But if you're really looking for a flexible relationship and you're looking for someone who can adapt and even anticipate your needs and work around you, then maybe a little bit of the heart is necessary in order to get that working. And to build trust with the heart, we need sharing and caring. We need different methods to build trust with the heart compared to when we build trust with the head or a more cognitive-based trust. So setting the priorities, what's most important in the current situation? Is it a reliable performance in the short term or is it actually to build a long-term relationship that allows some flexibility in our workings? But then of course, the second issue is to connect it. What, what, what are even the opportunities or the possibilities of building trust in this type of relationships? In relationships where it's also about being realistic. Is this a relationship where actions are observable at all? Because then you also even have the possibility of building this kind of cognitive-based trust. But if you're in a business relationship where actions are just not observable, you cannot monitor, you cannot control, you cannot see what the other person is after, then it's not as easy or even possible to build this type of more trust with the head and you might be forced to rely on trust with the heart. And if trust with the heart is not possible, then maybe this is a relationship where you should not rely on trust, or that maybe this is a relationship that you should not have. And the current situation, I think, in many situations are making actions less observable. It's less easy for, each, for us to meet. It's less easy for us to communicate. It's less easy for us to see what's going on on the other side. So we are, the online world or the current situation that we're in right now is a world where actions has become less observable, but we are more vulnerable to each other. And I think that requires a little bit of more of trust with the heart and a little less of trust, trust with the head. So how do we set priorities if we integrate the two? If we look here in the upper left-hand side of this figure, if we're looking for a reliable performance and we're in a relationship where actions are indeed observable, then trust with the head, monitoring, clear incentives is exactly what will give you this type of reliable performance, trust with the head. I spent a summer one day, one time some years ago, picking strawberries the entire summer. As a strawberry picker, you are be being paid based on the number of boxes of strawberries you pick. It creates a very predictable and reliable performance based on monitoring and clear incentives to pick as many boxes as possible. But this type of reliable performance is one that builds cognitive-based trust, but it might not build the type of flexible relationship. It might not build the type of more relationship based on care or commitment that we need in other contexts. So if you look at the other, the right bottom side here of this fig figure, if we're looking for a flexible relationship where actions are not observable, then it's all about sharing and caring. Sharing and caring builds benevolence or sharing and caring builds care. A, 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 
uh, reciprocal expectations that we are in it together. We have each other's back and we will adapt to try to accommodate each other's needs and concerns. This type of trust, this is what marriages, or at least decent marriages are, are made of. Trust, deep level sense of trust with the heart. But maybe less common in, in a purely business to business context. If we are in the upper right hand side of this figure, we have relationships where actions are not observable, but still we're looking more into reliable performance rather than a flexible relationship. Well, then how do we build trust with the heart without completely opening ourselves or completely taking the big plunge into the relationship? But this is the point of where we usually talk about embeddedness to create obligations and commitment in a relationship. This is the type of relationship that I would have with um, my, the daughter of my cousin who sometimes babysits my children, for example. I'm looking for reliable performance for the person taking care of my children. And I'm hiring my cousin's daughter, not because she's a nurse or has the best credentials, but because there is a sense of embeddedness that creates obligations and commitment on her side and on my side of being in this type of relationship together. But I think the situation that most business to business relationships are in is actually the lower left hand side of this figure here. We're looking for a flexible relationship, not only a one to one, one time reliable performance, but we're actually looking for a long term relationship where we can collaborate over time. And to some extent, or to a large extent, actions are observable to each other. And here we, we will, this type of relationship, we face what we can call a trust trade-off. So by too much monitoring, by putting too much incentives, by too much detailed contracts, we tend, or we risk to crowd out the heart in that type of relationship. When we are getting monitored, sometimes we feel we also become more suspicious to each other. So by overly emphasizing trust with the brain in this type of relationship, we might crowd out trust with the heart. So here we have a trade-off. We can control each other. We can monitor each other if we want to. But if we do that, we might get a little bit too much of trust with the brain and we crowd out trust with the heart. And we get a little more of reliable performance, but we might get a little less of a flexible relationship that can really be there in the long term, helping us out. So the challenge in building trust under conditions of uncertainty, or at least my take on it, is that it's important to recognize the potential of this trade-off. Because it's so easy that we reside or that we revert back to the more cognitive-based trust. We feel it's times of uncertainty. We are all scared. We all feel vulnerable. And we, what we sometimes do then is that we try to revert back into actions of control, into actions of monitoring, into strict rules and strict regulations. And that's good because that creates trust with the brain and reliable performance. But it can be bad if we also then crowd out the heart from the relationship and then we get less of flexibility and less of commitment. And sometimes in a situation of profound uncertainty like the one we're in, it's important to try to keep in mind or at least try to reflect on, do I, maybe I need a little bit of heart in this too. And maybe I have to refrain from too much control and instead emphasize a bit more the sharing and caring or the embeddedness and obligations. So um, before we, we open up for questions and discussions, my, my take on this at least, or my, the way that I'm thinking about this in the current times is to try to avoid trading off the heart or the brain. Try to avoid refraining to control uh, in every situation where control is actually possible. And instead getting a little bit of more heart and try to work around the urge to control and monitor and instead get a little bit of more heart into the relationship. Starting small, but small, making small leaps of trust instead of big giant ones, but refraining a little bit more from control with every time you try to trust a part or interact with a partner. 
try to, instead of incentives like the strawberry picking context, try to align interest, figuring out what's in it for the other party. How can I get this person's interest to be aligned with my own ones? To recognize that also the other side has a trust dilemma there in this relationship and might not know if, if he or she can trust me in this times of uncertainty. To uh, establish escape clauses, like a prenup when you get married. So plan disengagement while you are still on good terms. Say that if we need to part, this is how we do it. Try to anticipate conflicts that can come into your relationship so that you know that if worst things happen, we can disengage in a reasonable and sensible way. So therefore we do not have to control each other all the time. Um, and then also not to forget communication. And it cannot be overemphasized, I think, especially in the digital world to signal trustworthiness, to communicate when your expectations have been violated. And we need to be even more strong in our signals when we meet on a screen than we are when we meet online or when we meet in person, because it's even more difficult to understand each other when we cannot touch, feel, see, and smell each other. And with that, I would like to open up for questions. Andrea, would you? maybe moderate the questions. I think that would make it easier. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot, Anna. Super interesting talk. Um, we have some questions in the chat. We can start looking first at those. Uh, the first one is from uh, Maria. She's asking about how building trust looks like for teenagers when they're used to build trust and friendships through online interactions. I think that is super relevant. I haven't questioned. I wouldn't know actually. I haven't seen any good studies of that. I, I think that would be a br brilliant topic for a research study actually to see a trust building patterns between teenagers who are more used to interacting online than, than maybe people of, of our generation who are, are less used to that. I am um, so I, I cannot say actually, but I, I think that's a extremely relevant question. So could you comment, comment, for example, on the relation between managers and employees now that most people, at least in Sweden, are trying to work uh, remotely? Mm. Yeah, um, also a, a very good question. So of course it depends on, on what kind of relationship and what kind of job you are doing. Uh, but also in this kind of situation, I think trying to avoid controlling too much or trusting too much with the brain, avoid controlling too much and try to build affection and care into the relationship. But in order for that to work, we need to communicate much more than, than we think is necessary. We need to have small instances of continuous communication, not wait till the big weekly meeting, but actually call each other or pop in the equivalent to just having a coffee with a colleague in the corridor. I think we need to be better at doing um, in the online world to just call each other up and, 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 and say hi and interact more frequently, but in, in shorter points. Yeah. Okay. And Enrico asks, how to build trust in an upcoming future where sharing will be the key? You, you mean like the sharing economy? We can ask Enrico to comment on that. Are you still there? There is still there. Let's see. Sharing a key to go ahead in the business. I, I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? He's saying sharing a key to go ahead in the business. Sharing a key to go ahead. I am going to. Enrique, maybe you could turn out your microphone. I would be. Yeah, you're on mute today, Enrico. You can deliver. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Sorry for my <laughs> cryptic uh, question. I mean, if sharing will be a key with all our stakeholders, I mean, internal in the company, uh, clients, uh, institution, you know, to go ahead in this very uh, hard period. Yeah. Uh, so sharing maybe maybe mistakes uh, maybe ideas uh, you know to go faster yeah. in finding solutions yeah. and develop business and, and so on so yeah. 
so is a sort of a situation where, where we, we, we need to, to put on the tables maybe some very um, internal processes. I don't mean all the strategy, I don't mean all the algorithms, uh, I don't mean all, all our things, but you know, you, you have to put on the table something more than in the past with all the stakeholders that you have. Sometimes also with some competitors, if you are uh, uh, on a table where there are also competitors. Mm. So how can we build a, a, a new meaning of trust in, in, in this situation where, it, this is my opinion, sharing mm. will be one of the more, most relevant key to go ahead, continues to uh, develop business or survive to this very hard period in terms mm. of business. Mm. Yeah, I, uh, I think it's a very relevant reflection. Uh, I agree with you that we, um, I agree with you that I, I think trust and sharing and caring is now more relevant than, than ever before. Um, but of course we cannot trust everyone and we cannot trust everyone to the same extent. Um, so maybe we also need to be more, more selective in a sense in, in what type of relationships that we really build very deeply um, and that are based on sharing and caring uh, and that we also dare to say no to relationships where we cannot uphold that type of deep level commitment to each other. This is, is a speculation on my side, but but I think in this in this world of uncertainty, we need trust in order to coordinate, but we also need to be mindful so that we do not misplace trust or use trust in a situation or relationship where trust is not adequate. And I think this is a dilemma for for, for many of us at the moment that we, we need to trust more than ever, but it can be more difficult to trust. And we cannot trust everyone all the time to the same extent. And how each and one of us deal with this dilemma, I think is a, is a matter of deep reflection that is required from all of us. Okay, now we have a question from Anton. It has a bit of background, so instead of me reading, I will unmute you, Anton, so you can ask your question. Okay, I just started to reflect on uh, the number of... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Anton, I, maybe you can turn your um, mouth closer to the mic or something, because it's difficult to hear. Do you hear me better now? Yes, much better. Great. So I um, got a little bit stuck on the, the number of 8% that you shown earlier that, that a lot of startups uh, um, normally, yeah, not really trust big companies uh, or that it's, it's more common that small companies don't trust the large one than the other way around. Uh, and I, I was kind of trying to build some hypothesis around it. So my question was more about like, uh, could this be a relevant hypothesis around that? And, and what I was thinking was that, um, well, the, the startup don't have a proven kind of record for, for a lot of deals that they have achieved. So it's difficult for the bigger companies to put a, you know, a brain-based uh, trust towards them. Um, and at the same time, that's probably what big companies usually do. They, they use cognitive trust more than heart-based trust. Mm. Uh, so this might be a competence, you know, that they don't mm. really um, have in it to a big extent. Mm. Um, so, so that was kind of my hypothesis, that it, is it so that, that, the, um, that that's kind of, kind of, could be a reason behind that. And I was also thinking about like, why are then the startups better than maybe larger companies to build this heart-based trust and uh, was thinking about uh, the factor of commitment that you mentioned or, or was one of the factors that that might be one uh, thing that startups are very good at showing since they don't have that much bets that they need to go very hard into something and and by showing that large amount of commitment and telling maybe also an emotional story behind why they do what they do they might be good at building heart-based trust. Mm. Yeah, I think these are the very relevant things. 
organizations do not really have hearts in that sense. Mm. And for big organizations, sometimes the heart, which is in the people, people have hearts right now, not buildings. But in big organizations, sometimes the organizational routines deviate from, from the feelings and the, and of the people working for them. So yeah. I think you're totally right that big organizations typically rely more on the cognitive-based trust that can be, um, can be incorporated in rules and regulations more, rather than the heart-based trust. Whereas yeah. the startup, the organization is very small and it's very connected to the entrepreneur or the team of entrepreneurs. And there the heart is much more prominent. But I think another thing that typically happens in that types of collaborations is that the two parties come in with completely different expectations about what the, the, the relationship is supposed to, to generate. Mm -hmm. For the startup, they put a lot of hope typically in their big corporate partners, thinking that now we are almost ready to get a product out on the market because we have this collaboration with a big company. Whereas for the big corporations, collaboration with the startup can be something that they try out on the side or a much more of a much lower priority um, and or something that they see as high risk and is actually quite far from from business from the business and coming into this type of relationships with different expectations is uh, is a one an easy road to disaster so aligning expectations and trying to understand each other's thoughts and ideas coming into a relationship is of course profound in, in building trust but it's, a, it's an interesting topic in itself, the startup big firm collaboration. We actually have an ongoing research project on that. So if anyone is interested to, to connect into that, uh, please send me an email and I'll be happy to, to involve you there. Sure, thanks. Now we have a question from Alexandra. Alexandra, you're unmuted now if you want to ask it. Okay, I will do so. Uh, hi, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, topic in general and about daring to talk about it. But I think that also, which was raised in the previous comment, is that we mostly now we're talking about a person to person, basically, yeah, relationship or a smaller group, uh, yeah, relationship. But when it comes to say a uh, principal, like. Uh, agent uh, problem which you usually see when there are shareholders mm -hmm. there and when there is uh, like like uh, yeah like a management board and a CEO then I think sometimes even in such an uncertain situation the best way is actually to use your uh, brain best uh, mm -hmm. yeah, like, yeah, like based uh, trust I'm uh, I'm absolutely not against your um, your line of thinking and i also think that uh, trust be it heart based or also uh, brain based is very very uh, crucial and and now even more the heart based one um mm -hmm. is uh, but sometimes it's just really hard to like exchange uh, in certain circumstances um, uh, brain for heart because yeah. it's just yes. impossible <laughs> I, I, that's a, I think that's a very relevant comment it's um a heart-based trust is not always possible or not always desirable um, and um, we need to be mindful of how much we where we place our heart we need to be very mindful of that uh, it's not for all relationships and this is this is really the paradox and dilemma of trust it's when we need it the most and it, it can also be more difficult to build mm. So maybe um, one of the solutions would be to basically combine it, as you also said that, okay, in certain situations, the best way would be to use both. And maybe if, even if we're talking about uh, established companies and uh, um, like um, uh, board of directors that maybe in their team, they should then establish a little bit more this heart-based uh, mm -hmm. trust in order to be or act as a showcase for the whole organization or even maybe to some extent increase uh, trust level between the like management and um, and the shareholders yeah yeah i think so and try to work around a little bit of the trade-off between the heart and the brain uh, like we have here on the last slide with um, you know aligning interests instead of thinking about incentives starting small with many repeated interactions rather than saving it all for the big the big meeting 
but um, but these are these are not easy matters, um, and it, it requires a lot of reflection and some thoughtfulness. Thank you, Andrea. Do we have time for one more final question, or is it even time? We to have time for one last interaction. Osa wanted to say something about smart trust. Osa, please go ahead. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a question. I actually have a comment about smart trust because I think we've been talking about a lot about the heart or the brain or the heart of the brain. And I think um, the way I see it, uh, you have to sort of look at, uh, you have to use both. You have to use the heart and the brain uh, so that you achieve some, something I would call smart trust. There's an interesting book about that called um, Speed of Trust. Mm -hmm. uh, that I strongly recommend, uh, where you can sort of measure yourself if you are, if you are sort of you are, use too much heart, then you become gullible and people will you know uh, take advantage of you. But if you analyze too much, too much brain, then you become paralyzed. So you have to find sort of a, a combination of the two and develop a smart trust adjusted to the situation. Mm -hmm. So that was my contribution to the mm -hmm. discussion about heart and, and brain. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, which is a relevant, a relevant one, of course. And thanks for a very, very interesting presentation. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to, to spend a, a Wednesday morning on, on discussing the topic of trust. It was, um, it was lovely seeing you all, even though it's online. And um, please, um, please get in contact if, if you're interested in learning more or continuing the conversations in, in other ways. So thank you very much.